Hello and welcome to this course on the German Nobel laureates in translation, all 11 of them. Today we're talking about the second recipient of the Nobel Prize in Literature in German, Gerhard Hauptmann. We're going to be reading Hauptmann's play, The Weavers. Before I start talking about the Weavers and Hauptmann, I want to remind you of a couple of the things that I was talking about last week. There was first of all what I was calling the failed revolution of 1848. Now remember I referred to it as a failed bourgeois revolution. In, in other words, a revolution like the French Revolution, where the rising middle classes, fast gaining economic power, didn't want to be bossed around anymore by the nobility and the churches, and so they decided to, th to take things into their own hands. Well, this was only part of the story, because by the time we get to 1848, the political concerns or the fight for political power doesn't simply concern the state or the king or the emperor and the church on the one side and the middle classes on the other side, we also have a rising working class. And there is increasing attention to the needs of the working class. This is, after all, the time that Karl Marx started writing. So this other dimension to the political struggles of the time we saw that already in Heise's story, and it announced itself in the form of poverty. People are becoming increasingly aware of the plight of the working poor. Um, what and, and we have this phenomenon of the working classes, and often the working poor, mobilizing um, to try to gain political power. We also have the rise of what Marx referred to, actually Marx and Engels, referred to as the lumpen proletariat, which could be translated as something like the proletariat in rags. Lumpen means rags. Some people have said that lumpen is actually an antiquated form of the word knave. So workers who are in fact knaves, and that's how Marx intended it. He intended it as workers who are not prepared to fight for their own interests. Um, does that sound familiar? Yeah. Um, the working class not being prepared to fight for its own interests. Um, Marx wrote about that in, um, in the German ideology of 1846, Marx and Engels again. And after all, this is Old Hilse. Remember Old Hilse, who appears to be a really important character in the fifth act? He talks about how he sits and he works like a slave because he's going to be rewarded in the next world. That's what he thinks. He's going to be rewarded in the afterlife. So what does it matter if he's suffering in this life? And also when he's talking about the weavers who are rebelling, he says, have nothing to do with them. They're tempted by Satan. Um, and remember also, I referred to this last week, this is around the time that Marx coined that um, well-known phrase that religion is the opium of the people. And in the character of Old Hilse, this lumpen proletaria, we see religion as opium. Hauptmann wrote his play at the close of the 19th century, but the events he's describing took place in the middle of the century, around the same time that Marx was beginning to work on his um, political theories, and also around the time uh, in the years leading up to the revolution of 1848. In other words, the events of this time are set in the formats. So this is what happened. In 1844, there was an uprising of weavers in Silesia, which was in Prussia at the time, now it's part of Poland, in an area known as the Owl Mountains. This is the region around uh, the towns of Peterswaldau, um, now the Polish town of Piszcze, 
um, that's not how you pronounce it, but that's the closest I can get, and Langenbilau, the Polish town of Bilawa today. And at that time, in the 1840s, there was a long-standing and important cottage industry around weaving. And when I say cottage industry, I mean that a family would own a loom and they would set it up in their cottage, in their house, and they would work at home producing cloth. Um, quite different from working at home via Zoom. Um, so they would produce cloth on their hand looms, and they would produce, in this region, mainly fustian. It's a heavy cloth, and we learn about it quite early on in this play. During the 1840s, there was a surplus production of cotton in this region, and there were also falling prices due to increased duties. The character Dreisiger, the manufacturer, he laments the fact that it's making it harder for him to make a profit. Um, so this results in a fall in wages, and it's um, compounded by the fact that there's also increasing mechanization. So what Dreisiger, what the manufacturer experiences as a fall in profits, the weavers experience as a fall in income, and they're struggling already, so things are getting very tough for them. Um, and just as a kind of an aside, the mechanization of the weaving industry is something that had been going on for almost a century by this time. Starting in um, the middle of the 18th century, mechanical looms were made increasingly efficient, making it harder for human beings to compete. Again, is this a familiar story? Mechanization driving wages down, driving unemployment. Um, and um, you may be interested to know that the punch card, which was one of the preferred ways of entering information into early computers, was actually developed in the mechanization of looms. Um, and so when Ada Lovelace, um, that um, scientist who um, was one of the early thinkers of computer design, when she saw mechanical looms using punch cards to store information about complicated patterns in weaving, she understood that punch cards could also be used in, um, in, in information storage, in com computational storage. It could be, they could be used to store numbers, which is exactly what happened with the IBM mainframe right up to the 1970s before information started being digitized on um, wide-scale um, disks and um, magnetic storage. So anyway, back to weaving, back to cotton. The, the prices of cotton are falling, the weavers are earning less, they are hungry, they are in debt, they are not happy. Um, the prices for cotton were set by the manufacturers. They were set by the people who purchased the cotton directly from the weavers, and we see these transactions opening the play, opening Hauptmann's play. The largest manufacturers in the region of Silesia, where the weavers revolted, were two brothers known as Ernst Friedrich Zwanziger and August Zwanziger. Zwanziger is German for 20th, um, and uh, you'll note that the main manufacturer in Hauptmann's play is uh, named uh, William Dreisiger, um, so he's not Mr. 20th, he's Mr. 30th, but the reference is quite clear. And um, it's not just the name reference, the details are also um, quite historically accurate in Hauptmann's play. So, um, on the 3rd of June, 1844, a bunch of weavers, who happened to be singing the song Blood Justice, gathered in front of the Zwanzigers factory. Um, they were driven off by servants, and one weaver was arrested. His name was Wilhelm Mädler, and he's the character of Jäger in the play. <laughs> 
The next day, a much larger group of weavers came back to try to secure his release. They went to the Zwanziger mansion, and uh, he wasn't home, and they basically destroyed it. The next day, they proceeded to go to other manufacturers' houses, and they did the same thing. Now, as a result, the Prussian military was called out. Um, they opened fire on the weavers, killing ten men and one woman, and injuring many more, which um, incited the weavers to actually drive off the soldiers. They were not armed, um, unless you call stones and uh, sticks being armed against guns, but they managed to chase the soldiers away. And this is where Hauptmann's play ends. What he doesn't show is that the soldiers came back, of course they did, and they came back with more soldiers and more guns, and that was the end of it. What is interesting, though, is that the judges sympathized with the plight of the weavers when they were brought before court, and they were given very lenient sentences. And in some cases, in fact, the manufacturers were forced to pay to pay the um, the court costs. Um, also, this found a lot of resonance in the public. Um, the newspapers reported widely on the events. In fact, Hauptmann's play refers again and again to the newspaper coverage of events. And also in um, the history of thought, this was very important because, like I said, Karl Marx um, was looking at these events when he was first thinking about how capital works in our society. And um, <clears throat> he was 26 year old, years old. He was living in Paris and he was editing a newspaper called Vorwärts, Forwards. Um, it was aimed at um, a German reading public, even though he was um, putting it together in Paris. And he was strongly influenced by the Weaver Revolt. In fact, he developed his theory of alienated labor um, with an eye to what was happening with the Weavers. And also, if you read um, Capital, which you may or may not, um, but if you do, then he has numerous examples of how capital works and how um, labor produces surplus value, and his examples are often taken from weaving and cloth industries, textile industries. Karl Marx's friend Heinrich Heine, the poet, was also living in Paris at the time, and one month after the revolt of the weavers, he wrote a poem called The Silesian Weavers, and this was printed in Marx's Vorwärts. And in this poem, we read the lines, a curse to the king and a curse to his coffin, the rich man's king, whom our plight could not soften, who took our last penny by taxes and cheats and let us be shot like the dogs in the streets. We weave, we are weaving. A curse to the fatherland whose face is covered with lies and foul disgraces, where the bud is crushed as it leaves the seed and the worm grows fat on corruption and greed. We weave, we are weaving. So um, what drew Hauptmann to this story 50 years later? Well, he answers that question in his dedication. His dedication is to his father, Robert Hauptmann, and he writes, you, dear father, know what feelings lead me to dedicate this work to you, and I am not called upon to analyze them here. Your stories of my grandfather who in his young days sat at the loom, a poor weaver, like those here depicted, contained the germ of my drama. So this was um, apparently the main impulse for him wanting to tell this story. Hauptmann is regarded as one of the main proponents of naturalism in literature, and you can see why. Look, for example, at his characterization, which he gives at the very beginning in the stage directions. He writes, there's a glass door and to the right another glass door through which weavers, male and female, and children are passing in and out. And then um, he describes the weavers. He says, 
they are marked by the anxious timidity characteristic of the receiver of charity who has suffered many humiliations and conscious that he's barely tolerated has acquired the habit of self-effacement. Add to this an expression on every face that tells of constant fruitless brooding. There is a general resemblance among the men. They have something about them of the dwarf, something of the schoolmaster. The majority are flat-breasted, short-winded, sallow, and poor-looking, etc., etc. It's important to Hauptmann that we see the misery in their faces and in their gestures and in their comportment. Hauptmann was born in 1862 um, when Paul Heiser was 32 years old, so he's the next generation. He was born in Silesia in the same region that this story takes place, and later in life he was going to move back there. After studying art and attempting to make a living as a sculptor, and not succeeding, he moved to Berlin, and there he took up contact with a bunch of other naturalist writers, I'm not going to name them now, and he began to write dramas. His first major breakthrough was a play called Before Sunrise, and this was a play dealing with alcoholism among the poor, the descent of a peasant family into alcoholism, and its naturalist portrayal caused something of a scandal, and something of a scandal in the theatre will often make someone well known. That's exactly what happened with Hauptmann. Before Sunrise uh, premiered in 1889, and two years later he moved back to Silesia, and there he wrote this, the play about the weavers, which premiered in um, 1894. After 1900, um, Hauptmann receives increasing honors. He's a member of the so-called Berlin Secession, together with other leading artists like um, the painter Max Liebermann or the um, sculptor and graphic artist Kate Kollwitz. And, um, oh dear, in 1905, he became a member of the Society for Racial Hygiene. What? Society for Racial Hygiene, and seven years later he got the Nobel Prize. What? Alfred Nobel had wanted his prize to go to people who propagated an idealist view of humanity, I thought. That's what Nobel had said. I don't know about an idealist view of humanity, but there certainly is a criticism of the exploitation of workers in the weavers, a very, very strong criticism. But what's going on now? Um, the Society for Racial Hygiene was founded in 1905, and um, Hauptmann was one of the first members. He was clearly eager to join. Its aim was promoting the theory and practice of racial hygiene among the white nations. What? This is what it is? He joined, he got the Nobel Prize seven years after this. Oh dear. So, um, this group, by the way, was uh, very popular with the Nazis, no surprise there, and it was disbanded in 1945 with the fall of Nazism. So that's Hauptmann, and this strange story of political engagement and standing up for the working poor together with white supremacism. Um, unfortunately, similar things are going to be happening later on with the awarding of the Nobel Prize. But for today, that's Hauptmann, and that's all. I'll see you again next week. Auf Wiedersehen. <laughs>